for the Climate Discussion Nexus. I'm John Robson. Welcome to our latest readout video from our Wednesday Wake Up newsletter. And this one's a scorcher. Record temperature, 51.7 degrees Celsius. No need to verify it, right? Like that one in Verkhoyansk. Well, sort of right. It turned out to be necessary to unverify it because this one was taken in Australia in a place called Burke so long ago that it was 125 degrees Fahrenheit, not 51.7 Celsius, on January 3rd, 1909, which rather stood in the way of the narrative about how today's temperatures are unprecedented, so the Australian Bureau of Meteorology just dropped it, saying it must be an observational error because no official stations recorded high temperatures on that day. But one did. One skeptical Australian MP went to the National Archive in Chester Hill and found actual handwritten contemporary records for the nearby official weather station at Brewerina, Arena, showing 50.6 degrees Celsius on that day. Strange that the meteorological authorities couldn't find that record themselves, even though it was in their own files. Maybe they didn't look very hard. Because if they had, they'd have found that the next hottest day was back in 1960. Or rather, as that MP discovered, 1939. He found another inconvenient truth in the records from White Cliffs. And if you're thinking maybe Australia's an outlier or a long way away, the hottest day ever in Death Valley, California was 1913. And speaking of Verkhoyansk, it was over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the Arctic Circle back in 1915 in Fort Yukon, Alaska. In the newsletter, we also point out that Greenland didn't melt and flood all our coastal cities which you might consider belaboring the obvious, but it's important because the Guardian told us it was going to back in August 2010, only to see Greenland return to normal temperatures. It's no warmer there now than it was in the 1930s. Try blaming that on CO2. The newsletter also notes a new study saying there are four times as many songbirds in Alberta as we thought. It goes on to say, never mind, they're vanishing even if they're not. But when you think about the intricacies of computer models, and then you realize that the inputs are off by a factor of four in many cases or worse, surely it makes you wonder about the swan song the computers keep singing for us. We also talk about David Middleton lampooning yet another Guardian panic piece saying, ah, atmospheric CO2 is about to reach levels not seen in 15 million years when the Earth was three to four degrees warmer than it is today. Well, if that's the case, Middleton points out, it suggests that CO2 is not the control knob on the global thermostat, especially since he goes on to look at other geological periods with high and low CO2, including the chilly Pennsylvanian, and discovers that CO2 just doesn't correlate with temperature historically, which is my cue to thank everyone who's watched and commented on A Historian Looks at Climate Change, except the people who are really rude, and the ones who keep saying it's an historian. It actually depends how much you pronounce the H. A historian is right, and a historian is also right. In the newsletter, we also lampoon the New York Times for touting a month without plastic, even though they admit plastic-free July is uh, impossible. But it's still good because, they quote a sociologist as saying, it makes you feel like you're doing something good in line with your values, and that's good for self-esteem. No, it's not. Not if you're not really doing something good in line with your values. Surely telling yourself lies doesn't make you feel virtuous. But it does prevent you from realizing just how dependent we are on fossil fuels, not just for energy, but also for plastic and all that plastic contributes to healthcare and electronics. As a result, you end up advocating for dumb policies using a bamboo mouse on your peat moss computer. And speaking of silly, we also Tease the conversation for threatening Britons with French summer weather, as though having the Riviera come to you instead of you going to it were self-evidently bad. What's next? Are they going to have to eat camembert? No. What's next is that exploded RCP 8.5 scenario alarmists just can't let go of because it's behind that French weather scare story. We also have another 1919 or 2019 quiz. We come back to the quizzes routes in Ottawa, but this time precipitation and we have another in our series on Michael Schellenberger's apostasies, looking at his claim that, quote, the Amazon is not the lungs of the earth, end quote, on which, once again, he's right. So for all that and more, including hurricanes, visit our website, that's climatediscussionnexus.com, subscribe to the newsletter if you haven't already, 
Check out the videos, which you can find on YouTube at Climate DN. And if you're not already a backer, make a pledge to help us spread the word. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson.